All right, welcome back, everybody. I'm going to start off this unit talking about World War I. Um, now, <clears throat> I'll just apologize in advance for the length of this lecture series. This is a massive, massive unit. Um, basically, we're trying to fit four of the most influential events of the 20th century into a single unit. World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, and the rise of authoritarian slash fascist governments in the 1930s. And all of these have incredibly long reaching influence on, you know, modern contemporary history. So yeah, this lecture series, this lecture series is going to run long. Um, this unit is going to run longer than all of our previous units and longer than a unit normally will. Um, but I'll try to condense things as much as possible because obviously no one is interested in listening to a eight hour Ken Burns style documentary. Um, so we'll try to hit on the big points as well as integrate some detail that's going to be helpful for you guys. Right. So with the recommended supplemental viewing, um, it's all crash course. Uh, again, the world wars are kind of the most overstudied and overanalyzed events in human history up to this point, part because they're so recent, part because they're so influential on the rise of the United States as a world power, and partly because, you know, we had photographic and videographic evidence for like the first time ever. So we have a lot more information about them than we did, say, the diffusion of Buddhism across China. So <clears throat> these are all going to be big topics. And again, I'll try to condense it, but, you know, sit back and enjoy the ride. So let's start with why and how World War I starts. Um, as with anything in human history, there are both long-term and short-term causes. Um, the long term usually get the most attention, but the short term are equally as important. So in terms of long term causes, you can definitely point to imperialism as one of the causes of World War One, because the competition for land and resources between the states of Western Europe is is pretty high. It's pretty significant. And that colonial competition puts the militaries the armies, the navies of these Western European states in very close proximity, and it puts all of these states on very high alert, <clears throat> where even the slightest movement by a rival can be seen as an imminent move to war. Now, you can also point a finger at nationalism, though, because nationalism in the early 20th century is a serious political phenomenon. Um, the pride and national honor of these Western European states was held as almost the ultimate prize, the ultimate sacrifice that these states needed to make. And this meant that cooperation or concession or collaboration with one's rivals was seen as a sign of weakness it was seen as a slight or an insult to the national, <clears throat> the national honor. And therefore, it gave the politicians, the leaders of these countries, no room to maneuver or no room to try to make peace with one another. Any overtures for peace were seen as weakness or, you know, condescension in face of your, you know, mortal enemies. Um, now, thanks to industrialization, you also have a strong feeling of militarism in Western Europe. Um, this is the idea that war is a great thing. War is, and this kind of connects to the whole social Darwinistic view of the world, war is this natural state that since mankind has evolved, we've always been at war. And war is this kind of macho rite of passage where nations turn into great nations and boys turn into men and war shapes and it molds people and it makes them more and better than they were before. So with this kind of militaristic gung-ho attitude behind them, 
um, a lot of these Western European countries funnel billions of dollars into their military, and it leads to a massive arms race, especially between Great Britain and Germany. They become the two dominant militaries on the planet, right? It also leads to the development of new and more destructive weapons. During World War I, you see the <clears throat> you see the first use of tanks, you see the first successful use of submarines, airplanes, chemical weapons like poison gas, and flamethrowers all make their debut during World War I. Now, the long-term cause that probably can receive the most direct blame is the idea of the alliance system. Now, the alliance system goes back about 100 years in Europe. And what happens is, is after Napoleon's defeat in 1815 at Waterloo, the other states of Western Europe develop this idea known as the balance of power, right? And this idea is designed to keep one Western European state from dominating all of the others basically saying that if one state grows too powerful, its neighboring states need to form military alliances with one another in order to bring the scale of power back into balance. This way, no one state will be aggressive towards its neighbors if it knows that by attacking that neighbor, it will have to fight a war against two, three, four other states as well. Now, this is very like high school politics, mean girls way of negotiating peace in the most militarized continent on the planet. And what it does instead is it drags large, powerful states with very large, powerful militaries into much smaller, irrelevant conflicts. Um, unfortunately, one of those conflicts is going to be World War I. Um, when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary is assassinated in July of 1914, um, this is, for the most part, strictly a local conflict. Um, this is a fight between Austria and its Serbian neighbors. However, because of the alliance system, because of the demands of nationalism, because the fact nobody's national pride is allowed to get hurt, um, that drags Russia and its ties to the Slavic people into the conflict. Russia's appearance drags Germany in, Germany's appearance drags France in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, now, in the short term, like I just said, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand is one of the short term reasons for the start of World War I. Another one is what's known as the Schlieffen Plan. This is Germany's war plan. Um, ever since the unification of Germany in the 1860s, they have realized that they sit between two very powerful neighbors, Russia to their east and France to their west. So the Germans have always had a plan in place on how to fight a war on two different fronts, essentially in two different directions at the same time. And the plan that they devise is that they would need to focus the majority of their attention on France in the early part of the war, knock France out of the conflict very, very quickly. That way they can then turn those resources and those troops to deal with the bigger problem, which is Russia. Unfortunately, the quickest way to France from Germany is through Belgium and the Netherlands. And that is going to spark further conflict. That's going to drag Great Britain into the conflict. And because of Great Britain's empire and their alliances around the world, that's going to drag Japan into the conflict. And basically what you get by the end of all of this is the entire Eastern hemisphere of the world is fighting itself. So like we just said, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand triggers the alliance system. This creates what's known as the allied powers on one side, Great Britain, France, Russia, Japan, and then later on in the war, the United States and Italy. On the other side, you have the central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Now. 
because all of these countries have large colonial empires around the world, the entire Eastern Hemisphere is at war with one another. The majority of the fighting and the destruction, though, takes place in Western Europe. And thanks to that new technology that we talked about on the previous slide, the war eventually grinds down into a stalemate. And you have the beginning of what's called trench warfare, where both sides dig thousands of miles of interconnected trenches to fight from because the destructive power of these new weapons doesn't allow them to fight out in the open. Um, tens of thousands of troops a day die from machine gun fire, from chemical weapons, from um, artillery and things like that. So basically the war bogs down and the entire war from 1915 to 1918, roughly about three and a half years, is fought across the same 120 miles of land in France. Neither side advances more than 60 miles in either direction in four years, which if you think about it is incredibly strange when you look at previous large scale wars in the, in the history of this class, you know, the Mongols in an four years were able to conquer almost all of Central Asia and begin their invasion of Persia. And that was on horseback. So the new destructive power of these weapons is, is something that you can't underestimate. Um, now, because of that destructive power and because war has become so bogged down and based in trenches what happens is world war one becomes what we call a war of attrition a war of loss since neither side is unable to advance both sides set about grinding down their their rivals and their enemies and what this means is that in the past where victory in war was based on maneuvering and outflanking and surrounding one's enemy, or it was based on maneuvering to capture some strategic point, a city, a military base, some, some fortification in order to force your enemy to surrender. In trench warfare, those options don't exist anymore. So the only way that a war like this can be won is to literally wear down the other side until A, they're just tired of fighting, or B, they legitimately have no one healthy left to fight. And when you think about the population of these Western European states in the early 20th century, right? I mean, they've had 200 years of industrialization and urbanization and population growth. I mean, you're talking about having to kill 10, 15 million people before either before any of these sides are going to be willing to even consider giving, giving up. Again, because you have to factor in those feelings of nationalism as well. Now, like we said, the entire Eastern Hemisphere of the world is at war with itself in 1915. The Western Hemisphere of the world, though, is basically conflict-free. And at least the early years of World War I are excellent for the Americas. Um, the United States and Latin America become the production base for the entirety of World War I. Most of the manufactured goods for World War I come from the United States because their population isn't off fighting a war. So their manufacturing base is working overtime and making tons of money. Um, the United States actually becomes one of the wealthiest states in the world based on World War I, based on the money that they loan to European governments and European banks based on the amount of bombs and bullets and bandages and uniforms and whatnot that they produce for these European states. And the same thing happens in Latin America, not as dramatically, <clears throat> but they provide the agricultural production for this war, the meat, the cheese, the fruits, the vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Latin American economies expand dramatically as well, right? Now, aside from the war itself, um, the war has political ramifications outside of the actual fighting as well. 
because of their continuing losses in the war, there is a what's known as the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And this is led by Vladimir Lenin and the Russian Communist Party. And they actually overthrow the Romanov, sorry, the Romanov dynasty, which had ruled Russia since basically it's the Mongols left. Um, so 600 years or so. And um, they establish a new socialist government, the, the USSR, in Russia um, by the end, well, not by the end of the war, but shortly after the war. Now, the war itself finally comes to an end in 1918. And the reason for that is because of the entry <clears throat> of the United States into the war. Um, the German military feels like the only way that they're going to be able to win this war is if they cut off the flow of supplies from the United States to Britain and France. And they begin practicing what's known as unrestricted submarine warfare. And this means that any ship, regardless of its civilian, military, supply ship, you know, a rowboat full of puppies, no matter what it is, if it's approaching the coast of Great Britain or France, German submarines have the authorization to sink it. And this does very well for Germany up until American citizens begin getting killed um, in the process. And one particular ship in general, the Lusitania, which was a British passenger ship that had 109 American citizens on board, when that is sunk, that becomes kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back. And the United States starts preparing to get involved in World War I on the side of the Allies. Um, the final straw, the thing that, that finally pushes us into the war is known as the Zimmerman Telegram. And the Zimmerman Telegram is a telegram from the German ambassador to Mexico to the president of Mexico asking if he would consider essentially invading the southern United States with the Mexican army in order to keep the United States out of fighting in Europe. And basically the Germans promise Mexico the return of Texas and California and all of the southern southern the southwestern United States that they had lost in the Mexican-American War back in 1848. So <clears throat> when that becomes discovered, that sends the American public into an absolute rage, and they demand that uh, the president and Congress declare war on Germany, which eventually they do. U.S. troops start landing in Europe in 1917, this tips the balance in favor of the Allies, and on November 11th, 1918, Germany surrenders and the war is over.